Hello and welcome to the Quarantine Break Podcast. I'm your host, Simon Ward, and this is the Socially Distanced Tea Break with Extraordinary People. Like a parent dropping their kids back at school, I'm keen to get this one started as soon as possible. Episode 16 is such a delight with Mark Watson and Michael Chakraverty. I was on the sewing bee and I was like, oh, no one knows how to do it, that's the fun. And then Pam Ferris turned up with her own sewing kit and it turned out that she'd met the Queen with that sewing kit 40 years ago. And again, you start thinking, this is not a level playing field. It was really funny. I said, like, make, everyone always pretends they're shit at it until the show starts. But with her, I said, oh, you look like you know what you're doing. And she said, yep, I'm bloody good. Love these guys so much. And this is such a joyful episode. Let's get into it. And I started by first asking Mark how he takes his tea. Do you know what? I haven't had a cup of tea in some time because um, my dependence on coffee in the morning is, is uh, now quite strong and ingrained. But I'll only allow myself to have a certain amount of caffeine uh, in a given day because after that point, I begin to get what they call the yips. So um, <laughs> coffee has sort of shouldered tea out of my um, mental purview to some extent. But were I to have a cup of tea now, a cup of tea now I'd have it relatively strong uh, with milk and uh, I try and have it without sugar, but I'm, I sort of like it with sugar. I don't have a firm policy mm. on sugar. I'll allow it, uh, sugar in it in moments of weakness, I suppose that's how I'd put it. And Michael, how, what about you? How do you take your tea? I am also a coffee drinker, but I've been banned by Mark's <laughs> partner from drinking coffee past midday because I wasn't sleeping. Um, but I, I did not ban you from having coffee at any time of the day. She just strongly advised you that it will, <laughs> it will have an impact on your sleep. And she's right. Uh, and she said, don't come to me complaining. Actually, so she's overruling me. She's ha- she has banned you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in terms of tea, so I used to, I used to work in a theatre. And so when you're, whenever you make a cup of tea in a theatre and you sit down to drink it, you're called away to do something else and you won't return to your desk for maybe five hours so i learned to drink peppermint tea because that tastes nice cold so i would yeah. say my go-to tea is a cheeky peppy <laughs> and michael i would be amiss if i didn't ask what baked good are you pairing that with oh do you know what like something super simple just like a biscuit or something although i did make i made a cardamom cake today um and i think that would go well with a with a nice Earl Grey, probably. This is a this is a fundamental difference between me and Michael. <laughs> Nearly every time you speak to him, even though he's no longer baking on TV, he will just casually say, "I made a cardamom cake today." <laughs> <laughs> if I made a cardamom cake, I wouldn't just slip it into conversation. I'd have a party. Well, you're not allowed, are you? But <laughs> <laughs> I was running late for a podcast recording recently because I was scrambling around North Shields to find some pecans, um, which Mark found particularly delightful. <laughs> he turned up on the Zoom out of breath, saying, "I've just been desperately trying to find pecans," and again, I thought, "We're." different people in some way <laughs> I, i've never been desperate for pecans yet in my life i like them but it's not urgent so here we are just recording on a wednesday night just some guys socializing through laptops pretending like 12 months ago we wouldn't have immediately said fuck off when one of our mates suggested a wednesday night video chat so guys thank you so much for joining me today you're very welcome nothing else to do <laughs> I, i've already said that's not true of me but I, i'm happy to do this even though i have got other things in my life so in a way that's more for life. <laughs> Mark, you've obviously been using quite a bit of this technology in the past year for stand-up because obviously theatres have closed and we haven't had live comedy as such. Have you found using this for stand-up? Uh, it's interesting. A lot of us were, well, no, not a lot of us. I never was. But a lot of comedians were resistant uh, to it at the start, as were a lot of producers, people in the industry. There was a, I think, wrong consensus that it was imp- it would be impossible to do stand-up this way. And obviously it is odd. You're not standing up for a start. Um, <laughs> th- there are comics that continue to, they will stand at their desk and deliver gigs like this. But, and I get why, because it's sort of, you know, it feels more like the real thing. But I think, I don't know why, but it feels weird to me to stand up on your own. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've done a lot now uh, over Zoom, over some sort of inferior uh, copycat uh, platforms. And I think that, I think it's more fun than you would imagine. But stand up comedy, all comedy really depends on a sense of community. Mm. So the, if you can do something like this with, you know, Zoom, Windows, or whatever the platform is, people in Windows, if you can see and hear an audience, basically, then it's surprising what you can generate. At the start of lockdown, a lot of people attempted to put on gigs where you were playing right into a void. There was no one there at all. You couldn't see or hear Mm. anyone because they thought that it would disrupt the flow of it if you could hear anyone. But it's almost been, uh, the opposite has been true, actually. The more you invite chaos by letting audience members onto the call, most of the time, unless someone is a real dick, the more fun it is. <laughs> so, yeah, I think 
it's validated a lot of my feelings which about comedy, which is that, you know, if you go for a team spirit, if you all throw yourselves in together, that's uh, then it works better than it's what comedy is all about. But that only suits me because I am quite interactive as a comedian anyway. It doesn't, there are plenty of comedians that can't really do it like this because they rely on just delivering one-liners down the barrel. And you, if you did that on Zoom for half an hour, you'd go completely mad. <laughs> um, and also, all this said, I am very, very much looking forward to going back into theatres, as Michael is, as any uh, right-thinking person is. But at least there's been more of an alternative than we maybe thought at one time. I went to one of Mark's shows the other week um, and the distractions almost became part of the act, like the number of dogs that would bark at a certain word. It was, <laughs> it was kind of joyful chaos. It kind of You have to embrace it and it was fab. It was brilliant. Yeah, you get dogs, you get people that can't work out. The, you, you'll always hear middle-aged people saying, oh, I don't know how to do this. Do you know, I don't know. I, I can't hear. And that, again, I don't mind that because... In my real life shows, I've always built in that element of chaos and try to work with stuff. It's, oh, it depends how sort of serious and systematic you are about it, but it's meant to be comedy. It's, stupid things are meant to happen. <laughs> That's my mentality. And luckily, they really do these days. <laughs> Was that the first time you'd been heckled by a dog or is that is that a new experience? I can't even say it is the first time I've been heckled by a dog now. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, uh, if you play things like, you know, festivals, things like Latitude or these sort of things which have happened in the past, there's a very good chance that either a dog or a four-year-old will run onto the stage at one point. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been around long enough not to be phased by much stuff that happens. And that is... Uh, but I, I don't include pandemics in that. I would I would describe myself as reasonably for this. <laughs> and Michael, how have you found the past year socialising through video chat as a platform? I was reluctant, and then it became a bit overwhelming. I mean, it was like you had Zoom Zoom quizzes every night, didn't you? And it got to the point where I knew mm. all the answers to all the Zoom quizzes that were going around because <laughs> everyone was using the same Guardian list of quiz questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I found that it's kind of gone through phases, I suppose. When we started, video calling was all that we did. And then I, me and all of my friends and basically most of my family as well just kind of turned off it. We were kind of sick of it by, uh, was it like lockdown 1.5? I think we were kind of done. Mm. But, um, I was on furlough. So I used to work with a theater and sadly no longer do. I'm now working in a different job. Um, and I now spend all of my days on Teams, which is a Zoom, Microsoft, the Microsoft Zoom. And mm. you do find yourself realizing that you've just stared at a screen for an entire day, finish your work, make a cup of tea and then go and sit in front of a different screen all day. So my, my life lives within four, four walls. Do you want to call them walls? <laughs> Lines? A box? Yeah, we all live in a box in a way. My life has become confined to a square, which is tragic. <laughs> He's right about the uh, the Zoom quiz culture. I had to host a, well, I have to agree to host a <laughs> Zoom quiz for someone's birthday a couple of weeks ago. And they sent me the questions. The guy had done it as a surprise for his uh, wife. And most of them were quite gettable, but the one I thought mm. was hardest was something like how many I don't know, how many stomachs does an octopus have? Oh, but me, elementary, all of man. them immediately. So, oh, three, three, yeah. and it turns out <laughs> it's because that is in every quiz that anyone has done over the past year. <laughs> I think you mean heart, Mark. I think you're asking the question how many oh, hearts? Heart? How yeah. many heart? That's right. How many yeah. hearts? Is an octopus? That's like that's like lockdown one fundamentals. That one. Yeah, yeah. That's the one thing we came out of 2020 all known. <laughs> by the sound Henry, of it. Henry's wives. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Why are people doing that? If I was putting a quiz together, I wouldn't raid existing Guardian quizzes for it. <laughs> so I created a new round, which was cheese or service station. So that's more like it. Yeah, I would give you like a, a name of like. I can't even think of any of them now. I think one was, I know, I'm not even going to make one up, but I'd say Doncaster. And you'd have to work out whether that was a cheese or a service station. And it became more and more um, absurd towards the end. I was in one where someone did cheese or disease. Very similar idea. So, uh, you know, uh, horrible sounding things, which might be a disease from the 19th century, but might also be a cheese you get in Yorkshire. It, again, it was surprisingly hard, but I don't eat cheese. So it was harder for me. I didn't do one cheese quiz. What about Seton? What do you think that is? See, things like that. Cheese or a service station? Seton's a place, I reckon. Yeah, I, I'd also go place. Okay, that is a place. What about Barnsdale? <laughs> I've not been to Barnsdale services, and I've been to a lot of services, so I'll go cheese. I'll go place to split a difference. It's a place. Ooh. It's a place. Uh, one more, Charnock. Charnock is a services. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, playing a service station game with a, with a comic is probably not the best thing to do, <laughs> to be fair. All of us are wearingly familiar with this. Mind you, I'm starting to, I'm starting to forget some of these places. I'm almost, I'm almost nostalgic for service stations now. I'd kill for one of those, <laughs> uh, 
Ginster's slices that you get at two in the morning. <laughs> I, did, I also did, um, I did a European swear word or IKEA furniture. That was a fun game. Oh, oh that's Bob good. And Boris or Trump. And alarmingly, a lot of the similar um, things were said by both. Uh, so <laughs> that was more disheartening than anything else, really, that round. But you've shown you're an inventive quiz master, Michael. Thank you. If nothing else, I had nothing else to do, to be fair. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you spent both of your lockdowns a lot, lot better on Zoom than I did. I mean, we'll come on to your own podcast a little bit later, but am I right in thinking that you both actually met virtually in lockdown yeah we Strangely, met on that Twitter, is true, yeah and then through what mark has recently described to me as being called twitch uh, he referenced one of, our, <laughs> one of our friends we were talking to as being someone who was big on twitch and i just thought they, they, they really liked um that kind of phys- physical tick i suppose i was a bit confused by what he actually meant but twitch i believe is the platform we met on is that right yeah because michael guested on one of my 24-hour shows in fact both of them but um, and which was streamed on twitch this came up as michael said in conversation last week and i was amazed to find myself explaining to him what twitch uh, is because <laughs> uh, michael's 27 which is roughly about a third of my age so it's always him explaining um stuff like instagram to me and i have to explain who i don't know people like jimmy greaves were to him <laughs> but in a peculiar reversal um he he uh he joined me on the twitch without being aware of it yeah and <laughs> so yeah the podcast is a sort of weird uh friendship story based on the as as we've now told quite a few people the first time we recorded the podcast was also the first time we'd ever met and um <laughs> when we told the guests that on the first day they they uh visibly wondered whether we were just taking the pit like whether we were <laughs> the proper play. The, the, the um the first guest we ever had was a guy called Riyad Khalif, who's a um, gay rights activist, an amazing guy, really clever. And he says, who, el- who else have you had then? And we said, um, this is this is the first one, actually. Right. He said, when, um, so who else have you had in, in uh, on other days? We said, no, this is the first ever one. And it's all oh, right. Um, so how did this come about? And we said, well, also, we've never met before. And, uh, <laughs> at that point, I'm surprised he didn't just go home. <laughs> it's become the norm, though, hasn't it? I mean, I'm going through the perils of dating dating at the moment and like most of the dates that i have are through text <laughs> which is a bit sad but like meet, meeting people and being friends with people but not actually in person is becoming more and more common i think yeah we've had to reassess yeah what we call a friendship and yeah i started this new job uh, back in october and i have met five of the people that i work with <laughs> <laughs> and i work with many 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 people <laughs> that's weird yeah i've been um i've been working on a project with a production company for uh well almost exactly a year because the first meeting i was meant to have for them got changed into a zoom because it was it was the first time i ever mm. heard what zoom was yes and um i've now met up with those people i'd say a couple of every couple of weeks for this whole year but yeah never been in a room with any of them wouldn't know how tall they are or what, <laughs> anything about them really strange there are now people i feel i know quite well in the world without having ever been in a how tall, how tall would you say Simon is? This is a case in point. I could be standing up. I could be sat down. I feel like you're seated because you're quite st- quite stationary. I'm going to say you're like maybe 5'10". I'll go 5'8 just, just to make it, a, make it a game. I think it is about 5'10". Ah, oh, smashed it. Oh, yeah. I don't actually know how tall I am, which I, I should probably get around to now that I'm sort of 36. What else have you been doing? <laughs> Do you know what it's <laughs> No, I, I only measure myself in feet and inches, I think. Right, but you don't know what the answer is. <laughs> well, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, actually, in a way, I mean, unless you've recently been for a medical checkup or something, it's, there's no reason to measure yourself, I suppose, is there? Height no. But you only really do it once. You do it once, and then you kind of just remember that, don't you, really? Ideally, you write it down somewhere. Yeah, It doesn't yeah, tend yeah. to change that often at our age. No, once you do get the, uh, once you do find out, Simon, that should, should be good to go with that for now. Yeah, you'll be grand. That'll be another podcast <laughs> i mean i i remember in the summer when i was first meeting friends again it was weird because I, I think i was strangely nervous because we'd all become a little bit introverted i think after that first lockdown i felt a little bit shy i, I was anxious because i wanted them to like me again and i think the nearest thing i could compare that to is going on a date that i think i was blowing big time but what was that first meeting like for you guys did you instantly get on was were you like oh yeah this is great. I think we already had, we'd been speaking for quite a long time and we'd done quite a few Zooms and um, I guess we didn't really have time to think about it because we had a podcast record in about 10 minutes. <laughs> well, I remember seeing Michael outside the studio and um, in fact, I I remember getting into the studio and only then saying to Michael, we've never met. And it was uh, odd to both of us. So I don't think, I think it's an interesting uh, feature of the psychology of 
you know, friendships in, in the virtual age. Both of us felt as if it wasn't the first time we mm. met. I think, as Michael said, we had had plenty of chats online, but I was surprised at the extent to what, and again, last Friday, um, I felt like hugging Michael because, which was, of course we didn't do in the end, <laughs> because we were being sort of reunited after about three months. But I, I, again, I couldn't convince my brain that I hadn't seen him for three months because it had, you know, just the regularity of the Zooms made it feel like, so it, maybe we are getting to an era where, you cannot see someone in the flesh for a long time, but then that will sort of do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, it's interestingly, I um, I have formed a social bubble bubble with some friends who live l- locally, and uh, which means we legally can touch. <laughs> um, but I still find if they pass me like a bowl of something, I will flinch. Like That's I will, interesting. My, my, my hand will involunt- involuntarily flinch away from them, and if they come in for a hug, I have to I have to consciously remember that I can. And it's a weird sort of physical reaction that I've sort of learned, which is to cower away from anybody who comes anywhere near me. <laughs> and we're, we're all still sort of relearning that we can we can touch each other, not inappropriately. Although yeah. that, too, that too, if you want, I suppose. I love the idea of being in a crowded pub now, but next time I am in one, I'll be thinking, what what the hell is everyone here for? <laughs> what women do? How, how do I behave around? And especially get, going back on the tube or you know, going back into those situations is, is going to be... Um, See, I never have loved those. I never no, have. No, you don't like... That's the thing. The weird thing from, for me about this pandemic has been I, I do sort of... It's an unfashionable thing to say, but I do love crowds. I love being in the football or a, a music gig or I don't love being on a crowded tube, but in general, I do thrive off the hubbub of oh there's uh, a word don't human hear life enough, isn't activity there? It's, not, it's not a common <laughs> it's the sort of words you, you haven't heard much since a.a milne was writing but yeah like i um, i um it's been one of the i mean it's it's a pretty small thing to complain about compared with what some people have gone through but i find writing easiest when i'm constantly sparking off the the noise and commotion of uh yeah of just life i love just human activity that's been one of the with michael and i were in central london for one of the very very small number of times uh to record these podcasts last week and i looking around king's cross or holborn with absolutely nobody in was you know peaceful or for sure and beautiful just like everyone keeps saying when they post these pictures online but i found it really troubling cities are meant for people to live in a, a city with no one in it is um yeah it feels all wrong it feels like uh it feels post zombie mm. somehow <laughs> This is the first podcast I've recorded since Boris Johnson set out that roadmap. Although it's like when any dad sets out a roadmap to follow. There's a rough direction. You won't get there on time and you'll spend the first half going the wrong way and <laughs> arguing and screaming. Yeah, it's not a sat nav. It's certainly not a sat nav. <laughs> Michael, how are you feeling about things now we are in March 2021? If I'm honest, I'd say I'm kind of dreading it. Um, I Like I mentioned before, I... I don't like crowded places never really have i've always found that quite difficult to manage just number the number of people i find scary i was talking to mark recently about um windows in cities which sounds bizarre but it, if i see too many windows <laughs> in a city in, a, in my eye line i get a bit overwhelmed because i'm like there's a person there could be a person behind every one of those windows and that's a lot of people which again is really interesting to me that's a, a key psychological difference because i looking at the exact same thing i love it like i love the sight of a tower block knowing that one person is behind each window for the exact same reason Michael uh, dislikes it. <laughs> yeah, it's really bizarre. And so so when lockdown started, I was like, great, I can be introverted for a bit and not have to respond to texts or emails or people. But it became quite unhealthy. Um, I think at a certain point where I began, began to just completely withdraw, which people who are mentally ill can relate to, um, I just began to completely withdraw into my bed and um, had to kind of pull myself out of it, I suppose. But now... Now I've kind of settled a bit more uh, this year from kind of January onwards. I felt a bit more settled and I've created this routine that I live every day. And I feel sort of like that routine that keeps me feeling safe and secure is about to be taken mm. away. Um, and I'm going to have to start dealing with the things that make me anxious or uncomfortable again. And um, so there's that. And there's also this, I could, I, it's unusual to hear me saying this, but I think the way the government has actually gone about this roadmap is quite good um i think by giving us dates it kind of gives us a kind of a a, a hope i mm. suppose um because if they just said oh the pubs are going to open in the future we'd be like well we know that but just giving us a date even if it's going to change makes it feel more real and i guess on the on a second level to the the idea of of, of the lack loss of routine i think i feel a bit scared to hope for it 
as well. Yeah. I, I don't feel like I'm able to hope for something unless I know that it's going to happen. And because I have to hang my mental health, um, I have to have to hang it off things that I know exist. And I know that my routine today exists, but I don't, I can't hang it off something that doesn't exist yet. So I think I'm, I'm actually in the weird position of, I was actually feeling beginning to feel okay in the lockdown yeah. and now it's being taken away from me. And I'm like, Oh no, could we keep it going for maybe a bit, a bit longer? Uh, I mean, how long then, Michael? Can I just have a fist? <laughs> <back at least? laughs> That's the weird thing though, because I also want, I, I want the physical contact back. Of course. And I completely understand what you mean. I really do. In fact, I share the thing about um, not entirely buying into these supposed dates for for sort of the same reason. I'd rather not have them if they're not certain. Um, because uncertainty is really exhausting and this sort of false certainty is even worse. I'm surprised. I understand why. Because like Michael says, any dates are better than just vague promises. But I'm sort of surprised how readily some people have just like gobbled up these uh, roadmap yeah. dates. Because surely if last year taught us anything, it's that uh, things are changeable literally every day, which, which is itself exhausting, I think. All of that said, though, uh, for someone who doesn't like clubs and things, I am desperate to fling myself into Soho and to spin around to Lady Gaga <laughs> for about seven days. So there's a there's a, a lot going on inside my head. So that was a much uh, harder question than you asked. <laughs> um, uh, Mark, how are you sort of feeling about things now Now we're in, in March? I have been fairly uh, open and consistent about the fact that I um, really hate not going places and I'm looking forward to being able to do it. <laughs> I... Uh, like Michael says, there's a lot in your head at the same time. I, I um, despite being, despite yearning for the return of stuff like obviously comedy, but also live music and pub and restaurant culture and all of it, I do not want to see it happen prematurely again and cause us all to uh, to be plunged back into an endless cycle of this. So I'm sort of, you know, cautious on that spectrum of people that are like, let's just stay like this forever, all the way to we should be going out and like you know jumping into fountains now i'm obviously closer to the fountains people but i'm not one of these maniacs who thinks the process should be accelerated uh, i think broadly speaking the way they're going about it is again seems sort of right um a lot of last year was about when this is over we'll do this and that and i think gradually we've all learned that uh we won't be able to there won't be a day that dawns where mm. we have our late 2019 lives back so i spent a lot of time just trying to imagine how it will actually feel when we reach these milestones like june and july and august like the edinburgh fringe is in august maybe some version of it will be able to go ahead maybe it won't um summer holidays might happen in august for some people or they, or they won't I, I think it's quite difficult as a human to like michael said your, your mental health sort of has to rest on stuff which does exist not stuff which might exist so the way i keep myself going through it is for a start my partner and i have got this you know company we put shows on we we're, we're doing a lot in the here and now but also I have sort of writing projects and things which I can be doing whether or not things change drastically in the past mm. few months and uh, future few months. So I suppose uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Look forward tentatively to what might be coming next, but have enough stuff that I'm enjoying day to day that I could continue to live like this for, for, and that's been my strategy all along. Actually, the reason I've do, done so much stuff online is that I can't not be active at all. I'd go mad. So, um, I've I've just tr found ways of filling my days with activity which can go ahead regardless. Also, I'm lucky that I enjoy running and stuff. I do have a few hobbies which take me out of the house legally. Without <laughs> the running, I, I would really be suffering at the moment, I yeah, think. Yeah, but the running, um, the running is something that I use for my brain, and I found that became almost worse because people wouldn't social distance from me when I was running. So I was trying to hold my breath while running, which obviously isn't the best thing to try and do it in the first <laughs> place. And it just, it was even worse than not running. <laughs> yeah, I've got around that problem by the simple trick of going out running either when it's late at night or when it's cold and horrible. So basically no other bugger wants to be out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I do know what you mean because there's been times I've been running in the park and there's so many other people doing it at the same time. I've got into a um, not deliberate, but quite successful routine of running at sort of, six o'clock at night or which certainly through the winter months was something that no one else was stupid enough to do so i bought myself some mental space that way but again i'm lucky that running is such a transferable thing and it's my form of exercise i feel sorry for people whose equivalent is like regular workouts in gyms or spinning classes or stuff like that you know if your if your physical routine of choice can only be done in a gym or something this must have been a long three or four months
I was trying to think of sort of some of the positives from the past year. And I guess if you look closely, there, there are some positives. But I was thinking, actually, two of my big positives from the last year were two massive TV shows that did manage to film despite all of the restrictions on the TV industry. And almost by coincidence, they're two shows that you, you both happen to have been involved in 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 the past starting with taskmaster which came back late last year on channel four and it starts again on march the 18th and mark you were of course on series five did you watch this past series or did it bring back the traumas <laughs> by the way if the other half of this isn't bake off then there's a real yeah. <laughs> um, it turns out michael sneaked off to strictly and i didn't know about it we'll both be furious actually i didn't i haven't no because the uh, series 11 is about to start and i've not yeah. even watched the, the one just gone i think because uh, and it's bad because alex is a good friend of mine and everything but um uh my um one of the successful escape strategies that i've had mentally is my partner and i have thrown ourselves into quite a lot of uh huge consuming american dramas stuff like ozark mm. succession i suppose to a lesser extent not i mean that's not a lesser show but it's you know there's less Good of save. it but these big, big things like ozark or one called the, the leftovers uh oh yeah we're watching one about space at the moment basically my favorite tv in lockdown has been uh stuff that happens well beyond my own realm of experience where people have got a lot bigger problems than lockdown like in ozark they're permanently on the verge of being killed so i find my life quite relaxing compared to that <laughs> and um so um great as Taskmaster in is I've watched very, very, very little comedy for the past year or so because for whatever reason, what my brain craves at the moment is um like uh yeah, huge, weird, encyclopedic, drama filled things. I think it's to do with those things transporting me as far away from possible as possible from these four walls, where as Michael says, we spend all of our time. Whereas if I was <laughs> to watch Taskmaster, uh, amazing as it is, it would be a lot like watching the sort of thing my life already consists of and I'm a lot of the time trying to forget that <laughs> michael did you see mark mark on taskmaster before agreeing oh, to a podcast with him i was, I was scared you were going to ask this question i still haven't watched it i will i promise that's fine <laughs> i just haven't yet <laughs> the reason he's asking before you agree to it is that um although i did do quite well on taskmaster a lot of the tasks um showcase my well my problems with completing fairly simple tasks <laughs> and um, <laughs> So you might have there might have been question marks over my competence. If you, whereas I saw you uh, expertly baking for quite a number of weeks before it went wrong. So you know I had no <laughs> your TV history had held no fears for me whatsoever. I guess also pastry is slightly different to podcasting. Some might say and it's true. Neither of us has any relevant skills for podcasting. That's become clear. <laughs> We're lucky we have a very good producer stroke girlfriend. <laughs> not my girlfriend to be clear. Not in a thruple. Just mine. <laughs> it's not that sort of situation. No. Like no offense to Leanne, but not for me. Do you think you would be good on Taskmaster, Michael? Um, having not watched it, hard to comment. But um, I like to think that I'm proficient at everyday tasks. Uh, so. the thing is, <laughs> most of them aren't very everyday. It's things like, you know, how many of these can you fit into this thing? Or can you find a way of a company? I think you'd be very funny on Taskmaster because uh, you'd be, you're would be you quite ingenious about some things, but you're quite easily flustered. And that's a good combination. That's what I would say. <laughs> I would get quite cross quite quickly, but me being cross tends to come out funny. Rather exactly. Than... Those are the sort of people that they like. Yeah. Um, well, who knows? Perhaps you'll see me on Taskmaster in the future. <laughs> They've, they've started doing celebrity ones as one-offs and things. Oh, I'm not so, a celebrity, uh, Mark. That's plenty of that from you. you you've, been, they've, you've been on Bake Off, mate. I, I'll rest my, rest still my case. have like over 150 other people. So like... That's true. But then I was on the celebrity sewing bee. And again, the word celebrity is doing... <laughs> well, actually, the word sewing was doing quite a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> And Bake Off, of course, last year was massive, possibly bigger than ever because of the circumstances we all found ourselves in. Michael, you obviously watched the show last year because you do the live blog for The Guardian with Scott. How do you think you would have got on in, or Pandemic Bake Off? Uh, Pando Bake Off, I think I'd have done brilliantly because um, the challenges were simpler than my year, so I would have won. Ah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I think I would have, it's really interesting because normally, without going too deep into it, we have time off in between challenges so we film at the weekends go home practice then come back at the following weekend whereas for this bunch they filmed two days on two days off two days on two days off so there was less time in the middle and if you'd spotted someone across the tent doing something quite ingenious with, with a lemon curd you could be like oh i'm gonna do that next week uh, whereas this lot couldn't do that so i think mm. there's that element but i think also the the lack of support i mean emotional support i mean i'd go home at the during the week and just 
um, fling my mental illness at everybody and then come back and go and re- record again. Whereas with them, they were all together. That all said, though, like what a fun summer camp. Like I wouldn't have wanted <laughs> yeah. to leave. Like the kind of the kind of bonding fun. Like we were like we were playing like throwing throwing catch games with lemons outside the tent. Like it was properly pastoral Ina Blight and Bliss. Like imagine that <laughs> for like a full month and a half solid. That'd be dreamy. If you were gonna be in a pandemic, if you were gonna be here last summer, that was probably the place to be. Well, well, I think it's weird, yeah. Like if you think about last year during the bubble, everyone was like, Oh my gosh, what a sacrifice they all went through to film. Which absolutely, <laughs> which absolutely they did. Whereas this year they went to a bubble, everyone's like, Please take me, take me away, like, get me out of these houses. <laughs> I thought that even last year when they were saying that I was like yeah but they're having, <laughs> they're having more fun than anyone else I know did in June and July yeah such such a good show though and like you do find yourself uh, it's, it's some sort of comfort isn't isn't it so that was nice last year feels like the only show where a bubble would work I think any other show would sort of descend into Stephen Ke- King territory well they did part three throwdown didn't they that was a bubble I mean it's the same thing but mm. it's just with, with clay <laughs> um, but I mean all, all the formats with clay and sewing and, and baking seem to work quite well <laughs> and drag race obviously and Mark you've not done Celebrity Bake Off yet strangely I've been passed over for Celebrity Bake Off so far <laughs> yes it, it may be that uh, they know I can't bake but then that, that's part of the fun isn't it that was what James Acaster's ended up getting famous <laughs> for um it could be and i this is a hard conclusion to draw that i'm not deemed a celebrity in the same way as uh, say tim minchin or tom allen to name just a couple of my fellow comedians who have been on it but the thing is i don't know i have mixed feelings about stuff like that really because most of the things like this that i've ever done like the sewing bee i did the cookery one um I'm I'm sort of obviously there to be the shit one that is, is sort of <laughs> fun it's funny and uh that is, I'm aware of that and I, I embrace it on the telly. But sometimes, you, in terms of your actual self esteem, you think, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, the, the good thing about Taskmaster is that I was, you know, uh, always destined to be rubbish at some tasks, but I knew I would excel in other ways because Taskmaster is such a wide ranging test of your general, you know, mm. abilities. Whereas there was a period in my 30s where every other week I was being offered like celebrities, learn to ride a motorbike, things that I knew I couldn't do. And I knew when I got there, everyone else would be able to do them. And it would actually be quite a miserable <laughs> week. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I sort of, I drew the line under it a bit when I did this show called All Star Driving School, where they try to teach you to drive mm. in a week. It's a terrible show. And the people who make it are terrible. Uh, I'm, I'm perfectly <laughs> happy to say that. I've said it plenty of times now. Uh, this, this show shouldn't <laughs> be on telly. And um, uh, I was treated very badly on that show. But also the other two people, there were only three people contestants. And one of them had had uh, extensive driving lessons already um, and the other one had had some drive so I was the only you're often you they always tell you everyone will be rubbish everyone's a beginner it's a bit of fun and then you get there and it's a cooking show and someone's already like prepped a, a, like a sauce or something and you think ah oh, by everyone it's the same with the sewing I was on the sewing bee and it's like oh, no one knows how to do it that's the fun and then Pam Ferris turned up with her own <laughs> sewing kit <laughs> and it turned out that she'd met the queen with that sewing kit 40 years ago and again you start thinking this is not a level playing field it was really funny i said like make everyone always pretends they're shit at it until the show starts but with her i said oh you look like you know what you're doing and she said yep i'm bloody good <laughs> and I thought, oh, like, no messing about with pam so yeah i you know much as you're always encouraged to chase all the tv in the world that you can get i'm not really missing the bit of my career where i was deliberately cast as the shit guy in reality shows you like bake off and like going on it can like it can the, the peek behind the curtain can sort of spoil it a little bit i can imagine it might be quite sort of demoralizing to see that as well yeah um but if i was on bake off i don't think i'd dally very long because, uh, <laughs> because it's weird i i don't even i i think of michael as being quite sort of uh pernickety you know doesn't like getting dirty and stuff like that fairly but actually when it comes to baking I hate I'd hate having to like break eggs and plunge my hands in and all that stuff. The the sort of mucky aspects of cooking and baking I really hate. And if there's one thing you have to do in baking it it looks like is, you know, break a lot of eggs and stuff. So yeah, I think I'm best off out of it. <laughs> I'd be good value, but I don't think I necessarily enjoy it that much. It's it's like with strictly. People always say, Oh, what would you do if you and the, the fact is I'd probably have to do it, but I'd have a terrible time because I can't dance and, and everyone else that goes on it always can. <laughs> they just pretend they can't. Can we talk about your podcast? Oh, yeah, we should, we shouldn't we? Yeah. Should actually, we yeah. should do. So it's called Mankind. Michael, what is it about? It is about 
Oh, good question. Oh, gosh, yeah. We're not good at the publicity thing, are we, Mark? Uh- <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe the phrase is a deep dive into modern masculinity, yes, Michael. it is. We're talk- <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> I could hear uh, the producer laughing in the background of Mark's <laughs> thing. That's because she and I have to listen to that phrase every week when she's <laughs> editing this show. Uh, we basically, the the concept is talking about what masculinity is, um, uh, what it could be, what it should be, what it has been, to, to lots of different guests and kind of... I think you mean a variety of brilliant guests, Michael. That's what we say in the intro, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and just like working out what it is and how it impacts people, including us, I suppose. And I think... It's been really interesting learning a lot about lots of different people. And what's really good is that when it veers into being too sincere, Mark twitches and a joke comes out. <laughs> so it works really well. Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose I'm there to provide the occasional moments of... No, but I mean, Michael also does loads of joking around. But Michael's um, more uh, fearless, really, about wading into the deep stuff, especially because um, he's... It's weird to talk about different generations, but a lot of our guests are... The, sort of, the age of Michael. A lot of there's a lot of people in their twenties, and that the age of Michael. I'd watch that. The age of Michael <laughs> <laughs> coming soon. <laughs> the age of Michael is how this period of history will be referred to in a hundred years. <laughs> and um, so yeah, I, I feel like I learn a lot from it. Um, but sometimes when you've been sitting there for ten minutes learning on a podcast, you think I'd better say something funny here. Otherwise, I'm not <laughs> he just find it very hard to switch that impulse off. I think it works quite well because Michael has. Um, a far more knowledge of the way that people in their twenties have kind of uh, reinvented, reunderstand masculinity and stuff. Whereas I've got uh, the kind of heterosexual, uh, straight, traditional likes football angle. So the fact we haven't got much in common has weirdly worked out in favour of the podcast, and it seems to have worked for the friendship as well somehow. <laughs> One of us is always on the back foot a little bit in the podcast, which is always interesting, and it's not always the person you would expect to be on the back foot. I mean, we had a conversation with uh, Rob Rinder last week, and I was on the back foot for the first half of the conversation, which isn't necessarily what you would expect. So I think it's been really great in terms of just exploring different perspectives. Yeah, sometimes people unexpectedly bring up football or something, sport in general, I mean, my element. Uh, people that you wouldn't expect but then other guests unexpectedly bring up things like penis size and i'm out of my element <laughs> <laughs> michael on the other hand is, is reasonably confident oh, <laughs> thrilled <laughs> so where did this idea for a podcast come about obviously you you, you met uh, during lockdown but when did you start sort of spitballing this idea for this kind of podcast it was really michael's impetus behind In- impetus. it impetus gosh you're full of the words today impetus also excellent <laughs> Impetus not just today, Michael. Impetus and hubbub. Look at that. We're doing so well. I'm absolutely full of words. Mate. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> on Bake Off, I did a lot of crying on Bake Off, which is just how I express myself. It's how when I'm stressed, I cry. Um, and I got a lot of abuse online because of it, predominantly from men who were frustrated that for some reason my crying. I don't know, impacted them, negated my masculinity, which in turn upset them. And I've always kind of had that on my mind. That was 2019. It's always been kind of playing in my mind and been thinking about it. And then, yeah, Mark and I got to talking about um, about things and, we, and, uh, and the idea of doing a podcast came up and it started off being, we'd love to talk to different men about what masculinity meant to them. And then it kind of just grew from that, well, because we were thinking, well, it's not just men that are impacted by masculinity it's non-binary people it's trans people it's women it's everybody so um it kind of really started there and kind of grew arms and legs and i'm really proud of where it's um come to i think i I got home uh after the weekend of of recording this weekend and felt really fulfilled like i felt like i'd learned a lot i'd laughed a lot it had honestly just been great and i'm I kind of sometimes forget it's being recorded because Mark and I have have a lovely time doing the actual interviews and the conversations and we don't have to listen to it again um, for months, whereas (laughs) the producers have to sit and painstakingly recreate our conversation. So Yeah, um, one of them lives with me, of course, which means I also am painstakingly (laughs) reliving (laughs) it. So for me, I'm having a lovely time. (laughs) Michael's right. It's been, um, in a way, it's been, I mean, it would have been fun anyway, but it's kind of been more fun as a lockdown project, which is not to say we won't consider it, uh, continue it, I'm sure we will, but... uh, it's refreshing to talk to a range of people at a time when you, you know, go. It's, what's weird is only the first five guests, I think, were actually in the room with us because we sneaked a weekend in, you know, in one of those windows of lockdown where that was possible. So most of this podcast has been done entirely, uh, well, not entirely um, 
distantly because my Michael and I have been together. But yeah, when we get to make a podcast where we can actually meet people again, who knows what that'll be like. Masculinity and the spectrum that word encompasses is obviously so great. But why, why, why do we need to talk about masculinity now, do you think? I think at the moment there's been a bit more of... Um, a brilliant change in in the world around us where we start talking about men's mental health in particular and i think part of that has come from seeing a more diverse range of men in the media and out there and a, and, a, and a, that diverse range of men being happy to articulate or express themselves in different and new ways because of that that kind of that, that expansion of of representation and i think that has pushed this conversation about men's mental health and that in turn has made people kind of start to question why they are the way they are and what structures are upon them. I mean, there's been lots of talk um, about oppression of uh, lots of different groups by men. And I'm not saying that's not important just because men are sort of talking, just to be clear. Um, But I don't think men realize that they were oppressing themselves um, until fairly recently because of that representation of different voices coming forward who've said they felt certain ways. For example, uh, a lot of gay gay men's experience or bi men's experience is is of um, bullying or oppression or just systematic oppression of, of them when they were growing up and that led them to feel different. So they've always felt like a bit of an outsider to, to, to masculinity and therefore seeing their voices and hearing their voices has led men, a lot of men, to kind of be a bit more introspective and think about how how were they formed in the way they are. And I guess that's sort of what our podcast is also doing, is kind of going, what made you who you are now? And what could that, how could that have been different? Or how could that be different now? Is, does that yeah. really answer it? I've kind of gone a bit roundabout there. Yeah, I think this is sort of a, um, this is a no trans pun intended, it's, it's sort of a, a transitional moment for masculinity because th- these days at least um you know, gay men queer men of all types, all sorts of people identify as men at least have a voice like everyone knows they exist and that has to be that has to be incorporated into society um at, but there is a, obviously a massive gap between uh, how those people feel about themselves and who they are and how well they're widely accepted in the community so it's sort of like all right we at least understand who is who now what what do we do now? What, where do we go now? And also, again, women now have enough of a platform to say men have done this and got away with it for a long time. It's like basically, unless you're incredibly obtuse, you can't deny that certain types of men have had it all their own way for a long time. And now we're at the stage of admitting that most people are at the stage of admitting it and understanding it. it. There is a big question about how men behave in successive generations to make it a bit fairer, a bit better. And I don't think the podcast will single-handedly sort that out. Well, but it it's, might. You never like, know. Well, we're getting there. <laughs> it feels like a set of conversations worth having, definitely. But I think it's worth noting as well that it's not just like we're saying men are awful. Why? That's not what the, what we're talking about here. We're kind of we're talking about how have you got to the place you're at, and we're not just talking to queer people. We've talked to straight men. Um, we had Alistair Campbell on, for example. Um, we've had lots of different people from lots of different perspectives, but the one uniquely masculine thing that we seem to have picked up time and time again is that everybody who identifies as a man has felt othered somehow and a lot of their uh, a lot of their responses and their reactions has sort of come from a, a place of insecurity which is fascinating considering that the majority is the insecure one yeah it's i think it is kind of and what's nice is the listenership does seem to be divided roughly equally male female and you know it's not as if it's it's not uh as if it's aimed at men but as michael says it's not like about men bashing either the podcasts have been quite celebratory of men often people like queer people trans people people you might expect to have a massive axe to grind against traditional masculinity have often spoken quite movingly about their dads or you know male role models you'd never have guessed they had it's the, the difference isn't between um uh traditional straight men and the rest the the, the divide is between basically good good men and, and shit ones <laughs> yeah and like we hear a lot about the phrase toxic masculinity but yeah. what's the what's the other one what's the opposite and i think we're all, we're more interested really in the opposite rather than the toxic part yeah we're trying to blaze a trail for good ways of doing masculinity oh trailblazers oh i like that so that's a very good one that'll be the title of our next podcast <laughs> trailblazers. you have to be very confident in yourselves before you start calling yourself that I think. <laughs> It's, it's it's interesting this idea about sort of otherness because I, I I've spoken to a lot of people on this podcast and we've talked a lot about mental health and the effect the past year has had on us. Do you think the world going through this? 
big shared experience has brought us closer and and to have these kind of conversations. I hope so. I mean, the prime minister, love him or hate him, standing on that platform and seeing the words mental health wouldn't have happened 40, 50 years ago. So we have come on leaps and bounds. I think there's been a disregard for people's mental health, if I'm if I'm honest. I think there's been a... Um, at least to start with, people weren't aware of how this was actually impacting upon people. But it is much more in the common day-to-day -day vernacular. I think people talk about it a lot more. Um, bizarrely, they say they're taking a mental health day, which doesn't exist. That's just every day. They're taking a mental ill health day. <laughs> like it's That's not what that is. But that's just a, a, a second uh, side point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, I think it is being talked about more. And I do hope that we come out of this with a bit more of an understanding of ourselves and our brains. Yeah, I think it's pretty difficult to predict whether people will actually act with more uh, togetherness and empathy as a result of this. You, you might, I think the, the unfortunate truth is that if you look at the, uh, the things people have said in public on social media, wherever, a lot of the people you'd expect to be the best people have been and the people with really bad opinions have just redoubled those bad opinions so i'd say that the pandemic has brought out the extreme both good and bad in people and the mm. world that we return to will also be like that it'll, if anything it'll be more polarized so you just have to put yourself on the right side of that and you've mentioned that you've been recording some new episodes can you tease anyone who's coming up on future episodes as michael said we had uh, robert rinden judge rinder uh at the weekend that was a, a quite a chat um a side of him that you I don't think would see very often, mm. but then uh, what I love about the podcast is that a lot of them are people that I'd probably never have even come across, even if they're in fields of interest to me. Like we interviewed this guy called uh, Devan Ibanez, who's a first professional gay professional rugby player um, in the USA, but I think really worldwide in terms of his. Um, and even though I'm a rugby fan, I didn't know about that. And uh, his story is fascinating. Uh, we spoke to a guy that's. Uh, trans Christian, a couple of people who are like either Quakers or Christians, but also trans. So they're in, you know, the, a lot of the, uh, we've had some good names, like Michael says, but a lot of the best episodes are people that are not very well known at all, actually, but mm. they've, they've, they've got stuff to say that I don't think you'd hear that often yeah. on podcasts. We had a really interesting conversation with Bethany Black, which I really enjoyed. Um, she was really, abs just absolutely brilliant. We've had, um, I don't want to say everybody, but we also had Nikesh Shukla, <laughs> who was a big, a big one for me because I love this recent book. So some really interesting, a really diverse group of people, I think. Um, and yeah. I think we weren't really sure which chat was going to go where, I think, throughout the whole time. Yeah, it's an easy thing to say, but I think because a lot of people do podcasts, including uh, me, where they're uh, having to promote specific work over and over again, people do get into the habit of saying a lot of the same stuff over and over again. That's why there are among the three billion podcasts out there, a lot of them are fairly similar. So we're always trying to get people to talk about stuff that they you can tell when someone's telling a story they didn't expect to share with you. And mm. those are the moments we really love, I think. I have to finish up this podcast by talking about what TV you guys have been watching. Mark, you've already talked about some of the US dramas that you've been watching. What else have you been watching? Yeah, so I'd say our uh, intake, my partner and I... Um, and it is more or less, it's a completely united front because uh, neither of us has got time to watch TV individually. We've barely got time to do it together. <laughs> um, I'd say, uh, yeah, I, I'm struggling to think of anything that isn't in the category of weighty US drama, but actually they're not all weighty. Stuff like Succession, obviously, is like brilliant fun. Yeah. Uh, well, also not purely American, that, of course, Anglo-American. Um, we're watching a thing at the moment, where, and you have to have Apple TV for this, which I suppose a lot of people don't. I don't even know how we've got it. My girlfriend does all of that. <laughs> and it's maybe a trial, a trial thing or something. But we're currently watching a thing called um, For All Mankind, which um, is a sort of, uh, and this isn't the sort of thing I normally like. Well, I love stuff about um, space and things, but not, not sci-fi. It is not sci-fi. Um, the sort of thing I don't normally like is a kind of, I believe it's called a what if series. So it, uh, it's, its premise is that the uh, USSR won the space race, landed the man on the moon first, and also a woman on the moon first. And so it, it's about what would have happened to the world if uh, the USA hadn't won the space race and was forced instead to react so it plays out the cold war through the space race but in the 60s which didn't actually happen which as, as i said i don't normally have much time for this sort of thing when there are these films about like what if hitler had survived i normally can't switch, <laughs> off, switch off the part of my brain it's just like well i didn't did he it's fine <laughs> <laughs> but this is very lovingly done and it makes you ask questions ask questions about the way that you know history 
rests on the shoulders of a, a tiny number of people this is so forth um it's also lavishly done because apple tv have presumably got about a billion quid per episode so we what the previous thing we watched on apple was the morning show which is a uh, you oh, know, that's incredible, really isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so again, I, something I thought I've seen enough stuff about TV and the media, but again, brilliantly made and also brilliantly written. So yeah, I, I was quite resistant to Apple TV for a lot of reasons uh, to do with brain space and also morality, but uh, they have got some really good <laughs> stuff on there. <laughs> and Michael, what about you? What have you been watching? I'm not quite as uh, <laughs> into the deep stuff. <laughs> if I'm honest, I did watch I May Destroy You, which I've just rewatched actually. Oh, which we did watch that, and that seems ages ago now. That shows how long yeah. the pandemic's yeah. been. Yeah, um, but yeah, that was absolutely incredible. But I tend to go for a lot more kind of frothy mindless stuff i've been rewatching. i rewatched all of desperate housewives as i do every year um completed that recently um it's quite the journey um and, every uh, year every year i rewatch this i watch that re- it, yeah. really interests me that i've never i don't know i've ever rewatched a series because i'm oh, so intimidated by how much stuff is already is there <laughs> same as i ne- never really revisit a book because there's absolutely bloody loads of them that around <laughs> <laughs> i think because of this because of the I'm bored of calling it the pandemic. I feel like we've got like more interesting words. So the pancetta, let's say pancetta. Because of the pancetta, <laughs> I, I can't really deal. You reach for familiars. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I yeah. have to, I can't, I find myself not able to sort of process new stuff, really. I do get so that. I've been rewatching Desperate Housewives. Yeah. I've been rewatching Shit's Creek because I feel like I don't, I don't have to be introduced to the characters. I know them already, um, and that's fine. And I don't watch the last two episodes of any series because I am, um, yeah, I don't want to see it end. That is a real. <laughs> that says something about your psyche, definitely, Michael. Like, I knew someone at school that always read the last page of a book first because they they didn't like the surprise hanging over them. They wanted to go into it already knowing. And this isn't the same as that, but it's another thing that's quite telling of personality. <laughs> watching it, watching it for the first time, I will watch the last episode, yeah. so I know how it ends. But on a rewatch, I don't want to have to deal with feeling bereft, mm. so I just won't watch the end. You want it to be eternal, basically, in your head. Yeah. You want that universe yeah. to stay there. That's really interesting to me. I like security. I'd go mad if I did that. Yeah, I like closure. We're, di- we're very different people. <laughs> <laughs> But very few TV shows end well, so skipping those last two episodes is probably a good idea. I suppose there's a lot of shows that you'd have happier memories of if you had done that. Mm. Yeah, especially because of this current American mentality where they just keep making it forever until someone says, this is quite good anymore, isn't it? Like Drag Race, which seems to be on its 50th episode and only four people have gone home so far this season. Oh, gosh, yeah. it's exhausting. Whereas, yeah, I think oh, one of my favourite, Mad Men's my favourite thing I've ever watched on on television and I think it's almost unsurpassable. And one of the things was... Matthew Weiner always knew how many, well, I don't even, maybe always know, but he, there was a, you know, there was a finite number of series planned and it never went beyond that. You can always tell when they're just tacking on, when the writers have basically said, please don't make us do it again. And then they just couldn't say no to the money. And it's, I, I find it really fascinating that TV is made like this because you wouldn't set out telling any other story thinking, well, we'll just keep this going for as long as we can. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't write a book thinking this could be 5,000 pages. I suppose Dickens did, but, you know, most art hasn't been made in that open-ended way for hundreds of years. But now telly these days, it's just like, how long can you spin this out for? So I sort of yeah. like things that say, that's your lot. And like Ozark, they've said Ozark is the next series, that's your lot. And I really respect that because they definitely there's definitely 10 series within those characters. But there's something really satisfying about saying, that's the end of the story. And except it won't be, they'll do a spin-off. <laughs> There'll be something. <laughs> and unlike those US dramas, I know when to call it quits. So guys... Thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. It's been really fun. It's lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Such a fun episode, that one. You'd listen to that and think that Mark and Michael had been friends for years. They've got such great chemistry and you can catch them both on their brilliant podcast, Men Kind, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening today. We're already at the fourth episode of Series 2 and there's a great episode coming next that you'll love on Tuesday, the 23rd of March. And if this section of the podcast sounds a little bit like there was a cat licking himself in the background and refusing to leave the room, that's, well, that's my Saturday night, unfortunately. So sorry about that. Please continue to spread the word and subscribe to the Quarantine Break podcast. And do not forget those stars on Apple Podcasts. We love to see them. I'll see you very, very soon. But in the meantime, please stay indoors. 